All right, let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning and for gathering us and those that you will gather to the worship service. Lord, we pray for your blessing on this class that we would be attentive and be able to make the rest of the study of this second commandment, that we would be reverent, that we would have a desire to know what your word means and to know the manner in which you have prescribed us to worship you, that we would be more pleasing to you and that more glory and attention would go to you and not on us or any other created thing. We thank you for this and we pray for your blessing again. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're at question 51 and 52, getting to the last part of the second commandment section, and that is what is forbidden in the second commandment. That's question 51. And the answer is the second commandment forbiddeth the worshiping of God by images or any other way not appointed in his word. And then question 52, what are the reasons annexed to the second commandment? Answer, the reasons annexed to the second commandment are God's sovereignty over us, his propriety in us, and the zeal he hath to his own worship. So, we'll get to that passage, but I mentioned, and the reason I'm looking at this passage is uh, that there was two ways to commit idolatry with conscious religious motives. So now we're not even talking about that way of, um, well, I guess it's implied. In the first and second commandment, a pagan can be guilty of both. Okay. But specifically, in God's house, to be religiously conscious, trying to worship, but there are still two ways to commit idolatry. And so just be aware of that in not only the first but the second commandment, and that is, number one, wrong God as if the right God, and two, right God in the wrong way. It's kind of a short formulaic way to say it. Wrong God as if he was right, or right God in the wrong way. So here's how Exodus 32, 5, and 8 says this, and it draws this out. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And he uses his covenant name. So Aaron here is evoking, you know, the, the real, the real God in, on his lips. He's using the revealed name. But then it says, verse 8, They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So it kind of starts where he's worshipping true God in the wrong way. But then he specifically says, These are your gods, plural, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So I think it shows us there's a degenerating, devolving aspect to this as well. When you get the right God in the wrong way, that quickly starts to devolve into wrong gods altogether. So here's the outline that we're looking at today. We'll look first of all at the scope of forbidden images, secondly an application, but it's the main application, especially in reform circles, the controversy over images of Christ, and then third, the reasons annexed to this commandment. That's the second question. So the first two points are the first question. It's the what is forbidden question. And here's the scope of it. Now, in Brockle's um, Christian's Reasonable Service, his systematic theology, if you will, he, he has this really nice, helpful division here. It breaks out this commandment, or breaks it down. Two divisions of three in the words of the second commandment. In other words, three subject matter and three activities. All right, so in order to eliminate any possible excuse for ignorance, the Lord has been very thorough to exclude three subject matter of depictions. So here's the three subject matter. That which is in heaven above, that which is in the earth, that which is in the waters under the earth. 
And then it outlaws any of those depictions. And let me explain how I wrote that. I was just trying to shorthand it. Brackle, and this is just his words. We can, in other words, he's not saying we can, like we're allowed. He means these are things we can physically do. Therefore, he's covering all of these, right? So we can be guilty of making them. We can bow before them. And we can serve such images. So in other words, these are, this is the combination of all the ways that you can break this commandment. That's really what he's doing here. And so in one sense, this is the easy part, because you can see the words of the text. These are the specifications, but there's all sorts of ways to misread it. You can either have a minimalist approach if you don't pay attention to this, and he's drawing it out so you don't make that mistake. The problem is you can make another mistake and start applying this to things that the context is not really talking about. Now, the issue of interpretation first comes down to whether or not these words in the commandment are sort of disjunctives, or, or, make, or, bow, or, serve, or else is a unified thought, so that what's being spoken of is the activity of constructing worship, right? So in other words, when I said or, uh, one question you might ask, so can I draw a dove or a burning bush, or as we'll talk about, a picture of Jesus, in a children's Bible? You know, that's one of the questions that comes up. And of course, those, th- those are different anyway. But those are just the first questions that come up. Is he talking about, because some people will look at this and say, he's forbidding any drawing at all of anything, period, end of story. That's what some people get out of this. That's why you want to avoid these, these ditches of a minimalist approach. On the other hand, you want to avoid this anything and everything out of context approach. So last time we saw the rationale behind it. That's why I drew this out. In Deuteronomy 4.15, the rationale of the whole commandment was, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form On the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure. See, so that's the rationale. Since you saw no form, therefore do not depict him as if he has a form. So in other words, worship, yes, but also the divine essence. So I have in this chart my, and by the way, when I make representations, one of the reasons I like circles so much is I like to keep it to logic and uh, Venn diagrams and stuff like that, because there I'm, I'm making logical distinctions. I'm not actually drawing pictures. Uh, and especially when you come to this uh, category where you're getting to the divine essence itself, because that's the real context. It's twofold, but it's coming together. The divine essence, so, so one question you might ask, okay, so if it's not worship service, then I can try to produce the divine essence? No, that, that's still forbidden. Okay, so you can make all sorts of mistakes in your thinking. All of these areas are what are off limits. In your worship, worshiping a different God, a different object of worship, that's out. But then also, Worshiping the true God in a wrong way, that's out. Why? Because you saw no form. The divine essence cannot be confined to matter or to any other limitations. Okay? But as we read on in the passage, in Deuteronomy 4, as it gets to verse 16, these are things being excluded. The likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air. Remember, the context of this is that's not God. He's not saying you can't draw pictures of birds. He's saying you cannot draw a picture of a bird and say that's God. Okay? The likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars all the host of the heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. So see the action words there. See the response words. Raise your eyes, drawn away, bow down, and serve. The words there are the same as the words are in the second commandment. So the psalmist in Psalm 95, 6 points these actions the other way. He says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And the same is seen elsewhere in the law in Leviticus 26, 1, where it says, 
you shall not make idols for yourself or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Now, a couple things. This prohibition, again, we'll do this with all the commandments, belongs to moral law. Uh, we want to keep hammering this home, at least, at least in passing, just to keep making the point that, yes, all the Ten Commandments are moral law. Here's why. In this case, it's evident first in the commandments of the Old Testament law itself, concerning both God's essence and the immutable character of representing something contrary to His essence. Does God's essence ever change? No. So then on the flip side of that, would depicting his essence, the necessity of not doing that, would that ever change? No. If, if God's essence never changes, then there is no possible world in which it would be okay to lie about him. That's, why it's more, that's what moral law means. It's unchanging because the thing is not just long-standing, but the very nature of things as God has created them, they cannot be otherwise. So that's what we mean by moral law. Second way to see this is in several New Testament passages which show that this is known by the law of nature. So here's a couple of verses, Acts 14, 11 through 18, Acts 17, 22 through 31. Those are instances of Paul speaking to the pagans and saying, you already know this, basically. Romans 1, 18 through 23, there he's not talking to the pagans, but he's talking to us about the pagans, or really about us, all mankind, in Romans 18 through 23, that we know this, nevertheless we suppress this, and we do it anyway, okay? But the idea there is that we're guilty because we actually already do know this. What about art per se? And I brought it up, but let me, uh, let me just go there. Uh, Turretin uh, makes a point about this. His very first thing that he says in this section on the commandment, he says, the question is not whether images may be made which ought to be valued by us. Rather, the question is, should any religious worship, whether called adoration or veneration, be paid to images of God and the saints made by the hand of men? And you might say, well, why saints then if it's about the essence of God? Well, we talked about that. Because in the veneration of saints and the invocation of saints, that, remember that hierarchicalism, the reason you're going to them is because you are putting your trust in them. And so, in other words, you're investing attributes of God in them. So again, right God and wrong way, wrong gods. Two ways to violate these commandments. And you can turn the saints into that if you're not careful. And besides all that about art, we see in Scripture God sanctioning artistic depictions even in the context of the tabernacle and the temple. Here's a bunch of passages. I'll try not to read all of these because some of them are lengthy. But just a couple of examples. Exodus 25, 18 through 20. And you see the same thing in Exodus 36, 8. But here's what it says. You shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work shall you make them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And it says in verse 20, and all, sorry, and, and uh, this is chapter 36, verse 8, and all the craftsmen among the workmen made the tabernacle with ten curtains. They were made, the, the curtains were made of fine twined linen and blue and purple scarlet yarns with cherubim skillfully worked. So, in other words, God is commanding them, make angels all over the place. Angels. And these two big ones at the very front. And you see that again in, in the book of Kings, in the temple once they got into the land. Exodus 28, 33 and 34, on its hem, uh, hem, this is the priestly garments now, you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And then 1 Kings 6, and these are scattered throughout in verses 18, 23, 29, and 32 and 35. It says, The cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open flowers. In the inner sanctuary he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Around all the walls of the house he carved engraved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. So you see, what do you see? You see depictions not only of angels, but things in nature, recalling the Garden of Eden, even, which was 
uh, the first tabernacle in a sense. But even of the final temple, we read in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 41, 18 and 19, it was carved of cherubim and palm trees, a palm tree between cherub and cherub. Every cherub had two faces, a human face toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. They were carved on the whole temple all around. So, what do we get from that? Well, we get that if you interpreted the second commandment to mean that art is out, that, that that's what he means by things under the earth and things above the earth and things under the earth, then you're, mis, you're misunderstanding. It's talking about the divine essence, period, end of story. God himself commands depictions not only in art, but even in the art used in the most pure form of worship conceivable. So just know that that position, you can know it's, it's wrong. I mean, it's just as clear as day. So what's true about art ought to follow for education. Though here there was a sly evasion that existed for Rome. We'll get past this uh, back to the regular slide now. Um, question 98 of the Heidelberg Catechism asks, but may not pictures be tolerated in churches as books for the laity? That was the question that Rome and that the Eastern Orthodox Church would say, these are the books for the unlearned. Well, I was there, and I think what the Reformers, for the most part, would say is, well, there's nothing wrong with those books for the learned, unless you're making them dumber. <laughs> because that's what you're doing if you depict God as if he were one of those physical things. So again, there's nothing wrong with the art, but what's the art communicating? And what they were communicating is that, well, we're not worshiping those things. Those things are teaching us through those things. Um, it, it's teaching us what to worship. Okay, okay. So the Heidelberg Catechism answer says, No, for we should not be wiser than God, who will not have his people taught by dumb idols, but by the lively preaching of his word. Remember that from last week, the priority of the Word over everything else in the church, even things that are ordained in the church like sacraments or, or artwork. So adoration was attempting to smuggle itself in on the train of education. Uh, think uh, back to Calvin's controversy with Rome. He made a distinction between these two Greek words because the Roman Catholic Church would say uh, that, well, there's different words for worship or adoration or serving. And that happened to be the two words here, latreia and dulia. And uh, you might be familiar with dulia because doulos is a very common word in the New Testament. Paul is always using it of others, and especially himself, that he's a doulos, a, a servant or a slave even of Christ. And so there's a verb form there that means serve. And so Calvin says, so that what belongs to God is kept unimpaired. Calvin's representing the Roman argument back to him. Um, what belongs to God is kept unimpaired because they leave him latria. So in other words, um, the first is actual worship, if that's what we were doing. But, but the second is to serve, from that other word. Well, Augustine had already corrected this, not of the Roman Catholic Church because it didn't exist. Uh, anyway, that's another story for another day. But Augustine was correcting the Romans and their pagan idolatry. And he says in his sermon on the Psalms, and he's already made arguments, we quoted him last week on the city of God, but he says, they seem to themselves, uh, here's actually some people in the church where this has crept in. So Augustine's saying, they seem to themselves to be of a pure religion, who say, I neither worship the image nor demons, but through the bodily appearance, I behold the sign of that which I ought to worship. So Augustine's clearly representing the argument that Rome and the East would eventually make. And he's saying, this is what they're saying. And in another place in that commentary, Augustine says, I worship not this visible thing, but the divinity dwelling there invisibly. So Augustine's contradicting that, but both he and Calvin are, are telling us basically what their argument is. But it's foolish. It's not something that people can pull off for one, even when you're talking about a dove or a pillar of fire or a cloud or something like that, or the burning bush. Um, but more controversially is the question of images of Christ. And I have on this, I'll explain the picture as I go, uh, 
Uh, my experience, people are a bit unpa- impatient with this. Um, I, I do get the question, eh, I wouldn't say once a week, but at least once a month, about the second commandment and, uh, of course, what they're looking for. You know, they want a quick fix. Um, I got a picture of Jesus on my, I'm pretty sure it's the Mormon Jesus. He's, he's, he's glowing, and my mother got it for me. And um, I, do I, yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down? I'm like, okay, well, let's think about the issues here first. And they click, they hang up. <laughs> but th- because it, it's actually, you, there's actually a Christological debate behind it. Boring, I just want a yes or no answer. Well, you're, you're not going to get it, not from me. <laughs> I want you to think about this. I don't want to command your conscience. I'm not God, and you don't want me to be. Now, your whole point here is to escape idolatry, so don't turn me into one. I want you to think, and I, I want to help you think. And in order to do that, we have to... We have to study what the two sides are saying about each other. They're saying, in a sense, well, you're guilty of this kind of a Christological error. And the other side's saying, no, you're guilty of this. So what am I talking about? Well, you might remember, or not, months ago, months and months ago, in the first few questions when we talked about the nature of Christ and we used a Latin phrase, the communicatio idiomatum. And that basically is saying that what is true of either one of the natures of Christ can be predicated or affirmed about the person, but not of the other nature. You can't confuse the two natures, but because it is one person, you can ascribe to the person what is true of one of the natures. So, for example, in Scripture, Acts chapter 20 Verse 28, where it talks about God's own blood. God does not have blood. The divine essence can't bleed. But we understand he means Christ, because Christ in his human nature can bleed. Therefore, it is fitting to speak of the Son suffering, dying, and bleeding. But you say, but the Son is divine. Yes, But because his human nature can do that, it is fitting to speak of the person of the Son as he who died. Then when there's questions about it, you can clarify. You can, and you should, as much as possible. But it is only in that sense that we can speak in that way. In other words, here's the argument. You can't separate, and so here's here's one side arguing against it, and this is the majority of Reformed position, and especially the Puritans, would say that you cannot separate depictions of Jesus from the person of the Son. So just taking the communicatio idiomatum, and some people would say turning it inside out, but at least they're applying it the other way and saying if you can, and it's appropriate, to predicate of the one person what's true of either nature, then for that same reason, you cannot separate what is true of one from the person of the whole, right? Therefore, when you depict the human Christ, you are presuming to depict the divine Son. That's the argument. As difficult as it may be to think through that, that's basically the argument. Now you say, you can't separate. And so one of the questions you want to ask, well, are depictions of Jesus actually separating, or are they only distinguishing? And didn't the incarnation itself distinguish without separating? Um, Well, and you could also ask about that. Well, what about things like the burning bush? Uh, What about the dove to represent the Holy Spirit, and most people would say that those are physical depictions and not at all. Uh, So, for example, uh, theophanies or certain analogies of God, and that's why so often he had the angels, in a sense, speak for him, because actually it wasn't a confusion at all. Some people would just get nervous about the question at all and say, well, then we shouldn't draw those either. We shouldn't draw doves, because you might get the idea that that's the Holy Spirit. Well, you might get the idea that any number of things are God. So what's happening there is you're sort of expanding without any clear uh, command in Scripture. So Calvin says about the dove and the, and the, and the burning bush, he says, um, that was but a moment. And so, in other words, a, uh, 
it was a sure sign that the representation was meant to move beyond that. Um, but you do have to understand, and R.C. Sproul made this argument too about Calvin in Geneva. You know, Calvin took pictures out of his church. Calvin did this, and, and, and Sproul's point, and I'll just report this. I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on that. Um, was that that was temporary in Geneva because people were used to worshiping images and so forth. And so, anyway, I'll let historians debate that. The, the real point is, what's the right theology? And what is the Bible talking about? So here's the two Christological errors that I was talking about. And that really came to a head in the f- middle of the 5th century, right after Augustine died. And you had these two other opposing forces, Nestorius on one side and Cyril of Alexandria on the other, And one of Cyril's disciples in particular took his view to an extreme. His name is Eutychus, not the guy that fell out the window, but uh, maybe a distant relative, (laughs) another Eutychus. um, And so it was called also Eutycheanism. Um, And that was the idea that the two natures formed a... And I even heard C.S. Lewis even said this in Mere Christianity, and that's another red X against Lewis... Anyway, I love Lewis, but, you know, sometimes he shouldn't have delved into too much theology. He used the word amalgamation. No, no, don't do that. Um, It was not an amalgamation or confusion of two into one nature. And so you have monophysitism would mean one nature, that it becomes one nature or from one nature. You add another, but it's really just still one or something. There's different ways to commit this error. But on the other side, you had Nestorianism that so pressed the two natures that it, you know, they started talking like it was two persons. And people will talk like that today oftentimes. And so both of these sides say, your view of the second commandment is a Nestorian view of the second commandment. And the other side will say, your view of the second commandment is a monophysite view of the uh, second command, All, almost, a, almost a Gnostic or a Docetist view. Those are some other errors about Christ, that he only appeared to be human. And if God made him human, and he put his human nature before us, well, then how can we say that that's an error? Right? So that's, that's what's going on here. Because the one side will say, if, if you depict Christ um, saying that, well, this is distinct from that, then you're separating the persons, right? And the other side will say, but if you're saying that, it, that it's all separation and no dis- that you can't make a distinction, then you're really saying that it's one nature. Okay, so this is really a debate about Christology and how that applies in artistic depictions. So you might say to that, well, maybe after hearing that, maybe I am on the side of, of one or the other, whichever way you, you hear that. Um, let give you a couple more people arguing for it, because you might want to ask the question, is the human nature being seen, because they saw him in the first century, is that necessarily adoration of people who are thinking about it in some way later on? And, of course, didn't they worship him? I mean, Thomas, by touching his wounds and looking at him, and his human nature says, my Lord and my God. Well, um, that was then, and he was there. Dabney says, since there is no portrait or depiction of Christ which is authentic, therefore, basically, an image could only represent his humanity, could only represent his humanity abstracted. So so what is he getting at there? Basically, his logic is without the authentic, you're left with an abstraction. But you don't have the authentic, therefore you will abstract. That's the argument, basically. Now, that may be true, but you may still ask, does that make the representation worship of the abstraction? And doesn't that prove too much anyway? Wouldn't we just abstract anyway if that's the truth. Let's say there's no pictures at all. Aren't we going to have some image in our mind of what Christ maybe looked like, even if our minds never say, well, I'm not saying that must be what he looked like, but I can't help it. And am I committing idolatry and even bringing the image up in my mind? Well, both sides would say that we have to consider the weakness and tendency of real people. One side just condescends to weakness to promote the true. 
and so they'll set up images to help. The other side condescends to prevent the false. So they remove anything by which we would abstract and just and cling to that. In considering the fine distinctions that are made by certain of the scholastic theologians, Turretin gives his readers something to think about. They would think about an exemplar versus the prototype. So you have all these pictures down here, all these images, or Jesus movies, and some of them you can just throw out right away for obvious reasons, and others are better. And <laughs> you're like, better? What do I mean by that? Um, and then there's images, some of which are more reverent than others, some of which communicate better theology than others. And there's a spectrum, but they're all examples. And we don't get the idea that any of them are the thing itself. Well, Turton says this such worship is falsely prescribed to the people calculated to bring them into the most imminent and constant danger of idolatry. For who is there, either among the people, nay, even among the learned, who can either understand such distinctions or can rightly apply them when understood? So as by an abstraction of mind, while bowing before an image, not to give it any proper, but only a relative and analogical worship. Turton's basically saying, You've, you've basically uh, outdone yourself in trying to help these people and made something very complex and tangled, actually. You, you've come down to their level to, to give them this picture of Christ, but then you've said, well, it's okay because these are examples versus the essence of. And you start basically talking like Plato. I thought you started out to give the simple people something simple, but in order to avoid the conclusion of idolatry, they have to do some philosophy. So Turton's basically saying you, you've... You've missed your target. Um, it, it's not actually going to prevent them from idolatry and, and point them to the true God. But wherever we land on this, Paul gives us the summary principle when he was raising the pagans' theology from what they knew in being offspring of God to getting beyond their feigned ignorance. And so in Acts 17.29, he says, "...being then God's offspring..." We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So in other words, this is one more way to see that the second commandment belongs to the moral law. Paul is making an appeal to these pagans on the basis of common notions that they know deep down and that the true God cannot be contained, cannot be represented by any human artifact, nor even a set of finite thoughts in the mind. And that's really an important thing to remember in your, when you're debating a, an aberrant theology, whether it's open theism or, or anything else like that, you are reasoning common sense notions with people and not just comparing this text to this text to this text, but what you're doing there is warring not merely against a heresy, but against idolatry. So one of the implications of this, here I am with circles and things like that, and I'm doing this to, to a part of the reason I'm doing this, is to avoid idolatry. But can't I use circles and sticks and lines and even images in my own mind to commit idolatry? In other words, is the second commandment just about carving physical things or setting up images in the church? No. You can break the second commandment in your mind in countless ways by limiting God. If the real essence of it is limiting God, then you can carve up a God in your mind of your own imagination. And to that extent, we violate the second commandment. Now, I don't have this in the evangelical use of the law, but think about that with the evangelical use of the law. We are violating the second commandment anytime we do poor theology. So it, just, it gives you an idea of where perfection is. It's, it's nowhere near our heads. It's way beyond anything that we can do here. So last point, uh, the reasons annexed to the second commandment. This gets to that, that second question. And the answer says here uh, three things. God's sovereignty over us, his propriety in us, and the zeal he has to his own worship. And that covers positives and it covers negatives. Let's just take the last one, zeal. Um, this is a disposition that's associated with divine jealousy. So in Exodus 34, 13 and 14, this, this is the people's responsibility, not just their kings, but everybody really. He says, You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram, for you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is 
is a jealous God. I'm bringing this in because I know we already talked, I mentioned smashing idols in passing. But here it's added this disposition that we're calling zeal. And God even says about himself that he has jealousy and he wants you to associate it with his very name. Here, his, his name is jealous. That's a whole other class. You know, isn't that a bad thing, jealousy and stuff like that? And in God, it's not. It is a, we would call it, a passion for his own glory. But of course, he communicates this to us in what's called an anthropopathism. There's a fun word. <laughs> I talked about anthropomorphisms, the form of a, of a man when he, he has hands and lips and what. Well, no, he doesn't. Right, but he's depicting himself in the form of a man. Well, here, he's depicting himself as if he has passions. Because for us, on the human plane, that jealousy manifests itself in this disposition called zeal. And that was one of the prophecies of Jesus, that he would have a zeal for God's house. We see that even before Jesus, depicted in someone like King Josiah in his Reformation, and I mentioned that. And that command from Exodus 34 is something that Josiah took seriously and that we're supposed to take seriously even in our own lives. So here's John chapter 2, and you could also read about it in Matthew 21, 15. But this is Jesus. It says, Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not take my... Do not Make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So this is an appropriate human passion. We don't say about that. That was okay for Jesus because he's Jesus. And there somebody might have in their mind something that was unique to him in the incarnation, or they might have in their mind Jesus is God. Well, the second one won't work here. Because Neither one of them will work. Josiah is an example of why the first objection won't work, but the second objection won't work either because this is Christ in his human nature exemplifying this. Okay, and, and we already see that in the Old Testament. Uh, another example would be Numbers 25.11. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. And if you want to know what the crime is, verse 2 says, the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Phineas, with God's own jealousy, but in a way fitting for a human being, turned back God's wrath by, in a sense, cleansing Israel of these idols. Okay? Last point, because that's going to get into our evangelical use of the law, but last point here is the, the first commandment uh, sorry, the second commandment is the first with consequences. We think of the fifth as the first with a promise. That's true. But the second commandment is the first commandment with any consequences at all, in this case, a threat. Now, there's a good side to it, too. But the threat is in verse 5 of Exodus 20, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, there are objections to this. I'm going to skip over a bunch of them. There's moral law reasons for this. I'll just give you one verse. Uh, study this on your own, Hosea 4.6. It's a famous one. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Just read the whole thing out and think through that about some permanent way that the world works in ignoring God's law and the effect of that on your children and your children's children and so forth. But there's more famous objections to this. And the main one, uh, people will bring in a proof text, and that's Ezekiel 18. Um, this idea of God punishing the children seems to contradict um, that. I'm going to skip over another objection, too. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of objections to this. But this is the most famous one, I think. Wait a minute, this, this goes against uh, Ezekiel 18, that you're not punished for your father's sins. You ever hear that? And it's not just this verse that brings it up. Sometimes there's other verses that bring it up as well. And, and that, there it says in Ezekiel 18.20, The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Therefore, the visitation of the father's sin upon 
progeny here is just unjust. My first response usually, because it's usually a context problem, is read the whole thing in context. And if the context doesn't do it for you, keep going into the bigger context because you're totally missing it. In this case, it was a particular historic situation. Let me read the answer by Brockle to this. And he gives three answers to it. Number one, Scripture does not contradict itself. God states plainly that this, sorry, that this is the manner in which he acts, and whatever he wills not to do, he refrains from doing. In this case, namely in the specific case and context of Ezekiel 18, God promised that he would not do this. So Brockle's first answer is, this is actually something that belongs to God's sovereignty to do it over here versus over there. But, but that's not his only answer. Number two, even if the son were to I think it's be punished, that's a typo, be punished for the unrighteousness of his father, he is nevertheless not held accountable as if he himself had committed the sin of his father. Everyone's commission of sin is personal, but judgment may come upon the children, not eternal judgment, but temporal judgment. And then third, children are also sinful and are thus worthy of all punishment. However, God is and can be very long-suffering. Yet if the fathers aggravate matters greatly, this will create a situation where God's wrath may also be poured out upon the sinful children. And I would just say there, why would we be shocked as biblical Christians? I understand pagans. But why would we be shocked as biblical Christians that the highest crimes have the most severe consequences. And if you put it like that, you're like, well, yeah, the highest crimes get the severest consequences. So here's our problem. We don't really believe that those are the highest crimes. Adam's sin, his representation of all human beings, you say, well, this is really serious. Yes, this is really serious. And if you're an unbeliever, you kind of understand why they don't believe that these are the highest crimes. But the crimes against God are the highest crimes. But if that's true, then we should not be surprised that they carry the most severe consequences, that they ruin more things, including our own children and their children. So evangelical use of the law. And just very simply, we see a picture of Jesus, wrong ways to apply just about anything, but that doesn't mean throw out the right way to apply it. What church tables have we filled with our idols and our images? You know, the Bible in the New Testament refers not only to Christ, but also to the church as the temple of the Holy Spirit. That, that we're the ones that, that Jesus comes to in the prophecy in Malachi 3, when the Lord will seek, uh, whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Or in the, the passage that's fulfilled, for zeal for your house has consumed me in Psalm 69. Nine. So anywhere that we set up visual representations to God in order to bring Him near, and ultimately, why do we do that? So to bring the consumer near. There we have turned God's house into a den of robbers. And if you put it that way, I suppose everybody's going to say, well, we're not in danger of that, or well, no, that wasn't my motive, or something like that. But nevertheless, I'll just put that out there. Civil use of the law. We've seen that the state has its civil religion. This requires some visible, visible manifestation of worship. We talked about that with symbols and insignias, but really symbols and insignias can only take worship so far. Ultimately, personal beings have need of a person or persons, ultimate persons, powerful persons behind the forces that govern. And so it's not merely the the malevolence of propaganda that makes, you know, those stereotypical pictures that you're thinking of tyrants in their main square, whether it's a Stalin or Hitler or um, Mao or somebody like that. The reason they do it is because it works. But you have to ask yourself, why does it work? It's because there is a deep human need. Human beings, as a political animal, are wired to worship a person who is behind a common good. And so out of the devil's 
coin minting shop comes a new biggest suggestion about, oh yeah, I'll come back to that. I will come back to that after the quote, but let me set the picture up with a quote from D.A. Carson in one of his books called Christ and Culture Revisited. He's commenting on Matthew 22. It's a passage we'll come to, you know, where somebody tries to trick Jesus by handing him the coin. And so Carson says, when Jesus asks the question, whose image is this and whose inscription, biblically informed people will remember that all human beings have been made in the image and likeness of God, Genesis 1.26. If we give back to God what has his image on it, we must all give ourselves to him. Far from privatizing God's claim, that is the claims of religion, Jesus' famous utterance means that God always trumps Caesar. Now, this was written more than 10 years ago. I would hope that Carson would still say that. I don't think you'll see much printed today out of those circles that would affirm this. The popular reading of Matthew 22 is the same as the popular reading of Romans 13. Well, Jesus is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's giving us uh, two circles very far removed from each other. And so whatever Caesar barks at us from over there, we say, how high? And do it. But Jesus is actually saying the exact opposite. He was saying that 100% of everything belongs to God. Some of that 100% has been delegated down to Caesar. Just like you have no problem with a provisional authority in the case of the home or work or your teachers or anything else. There's always that as unto the Lord. Um, you know, obey them as unto the Lord, or do your work as unto the Lord, or in Christ, or something like that. It's always provisional, we understand that, and nobody has any problem with it. But when it comes to the state, we erase those parts of the text, and we say whatever they ask. And is that what Jesus was saying? Whose image is on that coin? What was Carson getting at? God's image. He said, no, it was Caesar's, yes. And Caesar is God's property. He's Christ's property. Matthew 28, 18 says that all authority in heaven and on earth, which doesn't mean all authority in heaven and on earth except for the state, because he's really, really powerful and everybody's doing it and you're really uncomfortable talking about this. No, including the state. So render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Well, what's that? It's what God says he's delegated to Caesar and no more. And the moment Caesar tries to get more than that, he's stepping out of his lane. And you do not give him that. When Caesar doing that? Pretty much all the time. So there's a way to keep that in his cage, and that's another story when we get to the second table of the law. But for right now, that image is always there for a reason. It's always commanding worship. And so... Uh, that's something to keep in mind when you think about the state and worship. Those are two different things. No, this, the state's just, and it's not just one more thing you could worship. It's, it's the main candidate that is put out there. And we'll keep pushing that point. What about the directive use of the law? And I'll circle back really quickly, oh boy, real quickly, to images of Christ. Let's just bring in Romans 14 to this and liberty of conscience. Anytime there's these, these issues. And when I... This doesn't mean secondary issue like not important. This is obviously of utmost importance. But sometimes when you have Christians coming to radically different conclusions, Romans 14 helps us with that. What do we do with this? Well, the same liberty of conscience that we extend to individual Christians ought to be extended to churches. And in that being the case, it is right for churches that are so convicted to remove such images. And not only is it right, but when a church is so convicted, its opposite would be a sin. Right? So Romans 14.23, the chapter ends, that whatever, is not, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. As we said last time, so much of the Reformed position was driven, rightly or wrongly, you could disagree with them, was driven to liberate the conscience from doing things in worship that the conscience did not see in Scripture. And when it comes to images of Christ, this is the first time I ever heard of it, was when I read Packer's book, Knowing God. And I kind of just left it alone for years. I just remembered it, blah, blah, blah. And then I got into this study, 
in 2009 with these other Reformed pastors in the Boise area, and we, st- we were studying Calvin's Institutes, and we got to that section in a big, you know, there was disagreement and so on. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember Packer saying that. Okay, I'll start taking this seriously. <laughs> and, I, and I studied it more. But here's what Packer says. And you have to understand, Packer is coming from originally an Anglican tradition. But he's Reformed, and he's a very big fan of the Puritans, obviously. So he's, he, in his thinking, he's considering both sides. But at the end of the day, here's where he lands. He says, the problem is that as soon as the images are treated as representational rather than symbolic, they begin to corrupt the devotion they trigger. Since it is hard for us humans to avoid this pitfall, wisdom counsels once more that the better, safer way is to learn to do without them. Some risks are not worth taking. So it sounds like, well, he is not taking a position. He's just kind of saying better safe than sorry. That's a position. That's a, that's a respectable position. And that's kind of where I've landed. So I would say to, so what I, one of the things I did in sermons after that, I, was, I would tell people, listen, if you're not a reformed church, but you're just a church planner and you're coming to this new Calvinism stuff, at least, at least, Rid all of your images, whether you do PowerPoint or whether you, you know, you're on your bulletin or you're, you're doing something online trying to reach out to me, at least take out images of Christ from all of that. And at least, you know, and, and you know, obviously these movies that come out, that's a whole other story, but I'll leave that alone. I'll just open it up to questions or comments or anything else. Yep. So I like Becker's, um, you know, what he says here. And that seems to make common sense, you know, better not to take a, a chance and contravene God's law. Mm-hmm. So, but now what if, what if you have a children's uh, you yeah. know, Bible book, right? And it's got pictures in it. Right. And there's a picture of Jesus at the table with his disciples. Yeah. What do you do with that? Yeah. Um... I would not command the conscience of any parent uh, to say that they must remove those from their house and not read them. One option is to, um, if, assuming the rest of it's theologically sound, yeah. is to keep those books and read them, like if that's all you have at the moment with one child, and explain to them that that's not what Jesus, we don't know what Jesus looked like. That's one way to do it. Um, during those years where I was in that church, we had tons of kids everywhere, we would have this uh, Jesus Storybook Bible that was uh, put out by Sally Lloyd-Jones. I don't know if she, I think maybe she was related to Mark. I don't remember. But she went to Tim Keller's church. And that was a big, and everybody, everybody had that book, okay? And that came up in those discussions. What about the Jesus Storybook Bible? And then Kevin DeYoung, who's now PCA, but even at the time it was URC when he was up in Michigan, and he came out with a children's book called The Greatest Story. We bought that too. And that doesn't have images of Christ because he's in the tradition where you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. But it's a better book anyway <laughs> for theological uh, grounding. And some people would say, well, there's no coincidence there. Um, but I'll leave that, I'll leave that alone. And, and I don't know the final answer. I don't know if it means we can get rid of all of them in the house or, we, or it's the end of the world if one of our kids comes home from Sunday school class or whatever else. With, they've made a picture of Jesus. Um, it's, it's a good teaching opportunity. We would tell them what the commandment says and how some people take that. Um, and the rest is really just a matter of shepherding and proper speaking to your kids. Yeah. My other question is, in Deuteronomy, it talks about, it's very specific, making a carved image. Mm-hmm. That's not painting the picture. Right. And it talks about not bowing down and not serving it. Mm-hmm. One thing people could bring in to say that that's only referring to stone images even, and I don't, I'm not sure that it is, because it would at least go to wood or whatever, anything you can carve. But in the King's Passage, where all that art is being put up, it par- almost parenthetically says that not stone. I can't remember how it says it, but stone is excluded. And the reason why stone was excluded, and this is just me paraphrasing Dr. Futaro because he brought this up, in an Old Testament class, is that the Canaanites would carve their stones. 
And so the Israelites would not carve their stones. Now, is there something magical about carved stones? No. I talked about this last time. The, the law, for me, it's a law gnome. For you, it's an idol. But for Israel, at, in, with their neighbors, they were carving stones. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't carve any stones. Even the altars would not be carved for that reason. And yet you have all this other artwork that was carved and depictions of angels and things like that. So, so what's up with the carved stone? So somebody that takes that argument could bring that verse in from Kings and say, um, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was just not carving. I don't know. But, but certainly nothing with the divine essence. That's also outlawed, um, any, even in children's books or anything like that. Yeah. Mm hmm What is it to have an idol? I mean, I know pagans had idols. What do, what do we look at as idols in our day? Anything we form into God's job description. That's my shortest answer, but meaning anything that is the ultimate object of desire, fear, or trust. And so, therefore, that, that brings in um, we can make mental idols. We can make uh, going out. We can make financial and relational idols. Some people do that, and we kind of, ah, that's kind of, that's really broadening it out, but, but, but in, a, in a right way, because we can make those things ultimate if we're not careful. So I think it's a, it is a specific definition, but it's one that winds up covering a lot of our sins. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, an example came to my mind of something that was created and then later, much later on became an idol. Mm -hmm. which was the bronze serpent yeah. in 2 Kings 18.4, yeah. where that had to be destroyed because they started worshiping it. Yeah. But it, originally, yep. God commanded it to be made. God commanded right. people to look to it. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Absolutely. That can, that can definitely happen. With, uh, and, it's, and I think that's one of the reasons that's in the Bible, to show us that we do that. Mm -hmm. the creation and right. the destruction. Yeah. But we have things in our church here, like there's a Bible up there that represents the Word. Mm -hmm. What is the Word? Who yeah. is the Word? Right. Does that represent Christ? Yeah. That's where you get into the symbol, symbol issue mm -hmm. uh, and not understanding yeah. the symbol. And that's what's happened yeah. in the church. And that's why Packer wrote about that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think it's a good rule. The better be safe than sorry rule. Yeah. Because if you look, we've got the Trinity right up there on the pyramids. Yeah. Is that wrong? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say no because it's triangle. It's more of that. It's more of the, those things. But... I understand, but it's a symbol. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Um, let me pray and uh, get to the service. Father, we thank you for this time and uh, focusing our mind, our attention, and our hearts on this issue. We pray that you would change us by it, that you would make us more careful in these things, charitable, yes, but ultimately reverential to you, seeking to please you in all these things. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.